I have to present uh, the next speaker because unfortunately uh, the, the people, uh, the person who has uh, been invited to be here uh, got ill and I received uh, an email from him um, this morning saying that uh, he couldn't come. So uh, it is my pleasure uh, to uh, to introduce Benedict Jackman. It was very uh, interesting uh, for me to open one of our periodic journals uh, yesterday uh, with our um, uh, report and the questions. I don't know if you knew already. You, you gave uh, an interview uh, and yesterday uh, it was out uh, in the periodic. So um, I can say that uh, uh, Benedict Jackma is um, uh, made a um, uh, background in medicine, and afterwards uh, sh um, she made a master uh, on environmental sciences. And uh, in this moment, uh, she is at uh, um, the Research Institute for Environmental Occupation and Health. Uh, but she maintains a huge relation with uh, the, um, uh, the Institute uh, in Barcelona, um, uh, where uh, she exchange um, works uh, connecting uh, the health issues uh, with uh, urban uh, problems, particularly uh, pollution uh, effects. So uh, she will um, tell us what is um, uh, about the, uh, is her research concerning these health uh, issues of uh, atmospheric pollution. Thank you very much for your coming. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here and to be in Lisbon. It's my first time in Portugal. And uh, well, at the beginning, when I was invited, I proposed the broader subject about environmental uh, risk factors and health. But it's so broad that I decided to narrow it down to my main field of expertise, which is outdoor air pollution and health effects. So I propose a, a quite a general presentation and then don't hesitate to ask questions. So, first of all, what is air pollution so, and why are we still interested in uh, studying air pollution health effects? So, already six years ago, uh, uh, the World Health Organization said that uh, even if actually we have uh, currently lower uh, air pollution concentration, we still have uh, uh, ev evidence of adverse health effects and more and more people are moving to cities and it's uh, predicted that uh, three out of five people will, are living in cities now and more and more will be in the next years. So according to uh, WHO and the uh, European uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, nine out of ten people live now in uh, areas where uh, air quality exceeds WHO guidelines limits. Uh, in 2018, WHO estimated that uh, air pollution, outdoor air pollution, was responsible of 4.2 million deaths. Uh, just a couple of months ago, um, some researchers made a publication saying that that was Low, uh, much underestimated and we could say that it's almost 8 million deaths worldwide occurring uh, due to air pollution exposure. So while it's true that most of these deaths occur in Asia and particularly in China and India, in Europe is still a problem and uh, we have almost half a million deaths due to air pollution in Europe and mainly due to uh, PM2.5. So what is air pollution? So there are many definitions of air pollution. Here I put you two from the US EPA and from Wikipedia. But in general, it's a disruption of the normal quality of the air that is harmful for humans, animals, and, uh, and, and uh, plants. 
any living organism. So what are nowadays the main sources of air pollution? So we have to remember that we have natural sources of air pollution. And we like desert dust, volcanoes eruption, forest fire, even sea salt, and also biological uh, sources of air pollution, such as pollen or mold or spores. And we have, obviously, anthropogenic sources of air pollution. And um, in Europe, in most of the cities, the highest uh, share of air pollution is due to transport and mainly to uh, traffic. But also industry and energy power plants are also sources of air pollution. Okay, so the main sources, as I told you, was uh, transport, mainly traffic, but also all the portuary, uh, all the portuary uh, activities and the, the shipping, the trains, planes, and in a lower uh, amount in Europe nowadays, the industry. And usually industry has been much more controlled uh, by European and, uh, and uh, national governments, and also it's located in more specific points. Uh, we divided air pollution in two main groups. So we have the particles on one side that we call PM and the ga gases. So the particles, we divide them in epidemiology according to their size. And uh, we have PM10 that ha we are called also, that are called also toric particles that have an aerodynamic diameter of 10 microns. And to give an idea of the size is between a pollen and a normal cell in the organism. Then we have PM2.5 that have more or less the size of a red blood cell. And then we have the ultrafine particles that have an aerodynamic diameter of 0.1 or less that are in the families of the nanoparticles that have more or less the diameter of a virus. Here is in a perspective of a hair cross section. So a normal hair is around 60 microns. So here we have PM10 and here we have PM2.5. So these small particles are inhaled and go all the way <coughs> to uh, the, uh, the lungs. So the very large particles that are above 30 microns, they stay in the upper airways, so nose, throat, and they are uh, easily evacuated by cilium and by the mucus. And then we have the PM10 that goes to the trachea, bronchia, and bronchioli. The, and then we have the PM2.5 that reach uh, the alveoli, and then the ultrafine particle will cross the barrier between the lungs and the, uh, and, the, and the blood, and so they will be in the blood, and they can reach any organ. Uh, so these uh, pollutants are regulated, and here I put you some examples of the PM values comparing European air quality directives and uh, the WHO air quality guidelines. So, for example, we see that the annual average of PM10 limit value according to the EU is 40, and the WHO air quality guideline is 20. But even WHO says that we have health effects below that. And for PM2.5, the yearly average limit uh, according to the European air quality guideline is um, uh, 25, and uh, to, uh, to the Europe is 25, and according to WHO, it's 10. And also, uh, there, there is, uh, WHO says that we see uh, health effects below this value. Uh, now there is a lot of lobbying of researchers and clinicians to try to decrease this value. It will be a problem because most European, southern European cities still are above 25 micrograms per square meter. So here is a, an example of a map of Europe. So it's quite old, it's already six years old. And so we have the um, color of the dot indicates the dark green is below 
20 micrograms per square meter, that is, uh, by cubic meters of NO2. That is the limit of the WHO and the European uh, directives. And then when it's not darker green, is we are above those uh, limits. And uh, red is the highest. So for NO2, we see a lot of cities that are not dark green. So above the limits stated by uh, Europe. For PM10, we also have a, a similar map. And for PM2.5, we have less dots because it's less measured, but we also have a lot of red points and very few dark red points. So how do we measure air pollution? So uh, traditionally and since uh, the uh, 70s, air pollution is measured uh, using this kind of devices, so this is a, ca a Spanish one, but uh, there are similar in all the countries. So there are fixed monitoring stations that measure mainly gases and more and more PM. So these are the devices that measure the different gases and particles, and also there is usually meteorological <coughs> uh, estimations. And we classify the station according to their location. So first of all, if they are urban, peri-urban, or rural, and inside the urban perimeter, we have the urban background that is um, uh, supposed to represent what we are more exposed in general in a city. And there are stations that are usually in parks, for example. And then we have the traffic a station that are really close to the street with a lot of traffic. The problem is that within a city there is a lot of variability. So this is an example of our graph. Here we have Austria and Vienna, but it could be uh, Portugal and, and Lisbon. So we have, that is here, the concentrations of a given air pollutant, so probably PM. So we have a PM that is long-range tra long transport and regional emissions. So there is a base all over Europe that we find anywhere we are, even in, in, the, <coughs> in the counties. Then we have a, a country. Here it could be also the, the Iberian Peninsula. And then we have the contribution of the cities. But inside the cities, we have a lot of variation depending on where in the city we are. So here we have in, in red, all these peaks are due to traffic hotspots. So it's not the same thing to be close to a high traffic road than to be in the middle of a park. <coughs> and also we have this kind of, of, tra of illustration where we find that the concentration of, of uh, traffic-related pollutants like NO2, PM2.5, and ultrafine particles decrease very rapidly according to the distance to the expressway. So here, if, if we are in the expressway, we have those different concentrations for these three pollutants. And if we are upwind or uh, down of, uh, south um, downwind, uh, we have a very drastic decrease of concentration of air pollutants. So even at a distance of 100 meters or 50, met, uh, 50 meters, we have a decrease of almost half of concentration of uh, air pollutants. And epidemiology, to try to tackle these problems and to uh, have real exposure, there are several methods. And one of the methods to assess the acute effects of air pollution exposure is, for example, that chambers of exposure. So we, <coughs> the researcher asks a healthy person or an asthmatic person, it depends on the protocols, to go in the, inside these chambers. And so they can be resting or cycling or walking or the, the, depending. And here, through this tube, they have air. So it can be air that is connected to a diesel motor or air that is connected to nothing, so it's not normal air, or air that is filtered. And then we measure some health parameters before and after the exposure. 
and we comp the same, usually the same participant goes under different scenarios, so one day he will have clean air, one day he will have a diesel air, one day he will have normal air, and so we compare within the same subjects how this health parameter, for example, lung function or heart rate will change according to the exposure. And so we can assess if there is an effect of the exposure on the short term on the human health. Another uh, tool we, we could use is to ask participants of our projects to wear personal devices. So here we have, for example, a device that measures PM2.5. So that is called the cyclone. It's connected to an air pump. So the air goes through the cyclone. It will turn here. The big particles will go down and the lower particles will go up and tr be trapped in a filter. And well, that's an example. So we have also other kind of devices that also follow the person and like the GPS and then we can estimate where they are and estimate uh, so the exposure of these participants. So that is an example of a filter before use and before 24 hour of use in the city of uh, Barcelona. So that is what reaches our alveoli in 24 hours, more or less. But well, that kind of exposure are good for short term or a few hours or few days. But when we want to explore the long term effects, so the effects of uh, exposure to air pollution during long periods, we have seen that the air pollution, sta the fixed monitoring station doesn't help us because there is too much variability with the city. So we uh, do uh, statistical models that estimate at every precise uh, uh, point, uh, place in, in, a, in a scale that can be different, uh, a different air pollutants. So here we have an example for France for NO2 and PM10. So here for NO2, uh, the redder, the highest concentration, so we can spot the big cities and also the, the uh, high, here is the uh, a, a spot with a lot of traffic. And here is for PM, so here they changes the color, so the browner is the lowest air pollution concentration and the purpler is the highest also, and we can see also that these uh, mathematical and statistical models can um, predict air pollution concentrations. And knowing uh, the address of our participants, we can know exactly in which dot of these maps they are, and so we can assess long-term air pollution, and that's how we estimate exposure in epidemiological studies. Uh, also, uh, in the last uh, decade and or, mo or so, more or less, there is a satellite images, so it's the satellite that um, measure the density of the air in some columns though for one by one kilometers or five by five kilometers. And so we can also have images worldwide and they are uh, very effective when it's not cloudy, so it works better in some countries <laughs> than in others. And um, well, so that's more the theoretical part of what is air pollution and how we measure now. Regarding air pollution effects, uh, the American and um, European Respiratory Societies and Thoracic Societies did a review of the known health effects in 2016. And this is, in summary, all the health effects that have been uh, uh, associated with air pollution exposure long term or short term. So there is obviously the lung that is what we think first as we, in, uh, as we uh, breathe, breathe air pollution, but also uh, health effects have been described in the endocrine system, in the vascular system, in the brain, in the cardiac system, even in the skin and in the reproductive uh, uh, outcomes. So I will detail a bit more. So um, regarding air pollution, we, try, we know that there is two kinds of effects. So there is first the short-term effects that are the acute effects. 
and that are the effects that occur hours or day after ex exposure, and usually after high peaks of exposure, high levels. These high peaks of exposure are, are usually due to uh, climatic um, circumstances, that uh, no rain, no wind, uh, high temperatures during a certain point, uh, and so during a few days we have very high levels of a given pollutants, and hour of day after this exposure, we have the acute effects. And at the, when, we, when the researchers started to study air pollution health effects, they focus on the short-term health effects. And in the 80s, when the air pollution concentration started to decrease, uh, the community thought that there was no more problem with air pollution. But uh, some researchers found that actually uh, exposure to lower levels, but for many years, could have chronic effects. So that is the long-term effect, that is the chronic effect that, could, that occur usually years after exposures, and that uh, occur even at low levels of, of exposure. And then we have the combination of both effects, the long-term and the short-term. So here we have uh, the frailty or the susceptibility of death for a given uh, subject. So we are all born with a certain frailty or susceptibility that sadly is determined more than 90% by our postal code. So our postal code with, is, a, is the better predictor of the fra uh, frailty or susceptibility of death when we are born. And then this frailty will uh, decrease until the age of 20, more or less, and then above 20, this frailty or probability to, to death will go up until uh, we die, okay? So also this point depends, as you know, uh, on the country, and there is in the world more than 30 years of difference between the highest and the lowest expectancy life. But above that, we have the environmental risk factors like air pollution. And so air pollution during many years can have an effect of uh, the expectancy of life. So even here, it can be decreased because of the mother exposed to air pollution during pregnancy, and then this slope will uh, be uh, higher and will reach death with a delta time before uh, when we are expect, uh, exposed to low air pollution uh, concentration, but during many years. And then we have the acute effects of air pollution. So above the chronics, we have the acute. So that means that punctually for a few days when there are peak of exposure and we have some kind of susceptibility, we can have a very high and steep increase of probability of death, then it will decrease again when the air pollution are normal levels again, and then again, and then again, and if we have that kind of a steep when we are uh, closer to uh, the death, but we have even a, a, a sooner death than the one with only chronic effect. Okay, I don't know if it's more or less clear. <laughs> Okay, so the short-term effects, so the first time that uh, air pollution concentration were related with health was in the 50s, so there were two big events in the Meuse Valley in, in Belgium and in, the, in London smoke, so this is pictures of the London smoke in, in 1952 where the visibility was more or less three or four meters and that was due at that time most of the heating was uh, carbon coal, so, and then uh, there was uh, no rain and no wind for several days, and a big drop in temperature, very, uh, a, a very abrupt drop in temperature at the end of November, beginning of December, and doctors saw and observed that they were having more uh, visits and more deaths. And then when they compared the air pollution concentration, so at that time they measured black smoke, that is more or less the equivalent of, of uh, the carbon part of the PM10, 
they observed that the, the, all, the both line, the daily death in London and the black smoke concentration had a very similar curve. And uh, even a few days after the black uh, smoke concentration reached uh, basal levels, the mortality stayed a bit higher. And then they did more statistical analysis comparing with other years, etc., and the association still uh, remained. And also uh, other kind of studies we still do nowadays, uh, that is a very nice study, even if it's getting old, uh, where they asked uh, asthmatic people to walk uh, two hours in Hyde Park, so a place without traffic, and then two uh, weeks or three weeks later they walked uh, two hours in Oxford Street, so a very high traffic street in London. And they measured lung function in these patients before and after walking two hours in the two locations. And in average, here we have one parameter of lung function. So in <coughs> comparison, in, in green, we have the lung function parameters in, um, in, the, in the participants after walking in Hyde Park. And in red, we have the lung function parameters in the same participants, but after walking in Oxford Street. And what we can see, there is a drop due to exercise that is known in asthmatics. But after the two hours of the exposure, this drop was much, much higher in part the same participants after walking in Oxford Street than in Hyde Park. And what is even more impressive, that is three hours after the participant after walking in Hyde Park recovered almost the baseline air po uh, lung function uh, parameters, but after walking in Oxford Street, even seven hours after wo uh, walking there, they still haven't recovered the baseline parameters. And this is another kind of study that is illustrative. So this is macrophages that are uh, immune cells, so defense cells that were uh, from the lungs according to different levels of concentration uh, of carbon in the air. So we see that we found carbon, the more the concentration in the air, the more the concentration in the macrophages in the lung. In summary, the short-term exposure to air pollution is associated with mortality, with increased long function cardiovascular parameters and also on the short term on, with subclinical parameters like markers of inflammation and oxidative stress. Regarding the long term effects, so as I told you this is the, uh, in, at the end of the 80s a very famous group of researchers showed that um, <coughs> explained this difference and this difference was explained by air pollution exposure. So the highest the air pollution, the annual average of air pollution exposure in the cities, the higher the mortality risk in uh, the participants of this study. In Europe, uh, at the beginning of the 2010 years, there was a big, big uh, study that had uh, for a study the so in blue And they uh, applied this statistical model to a lot of projects ongoing in, in Europe. And the main findings uh, that uh, were uh, the most uh, released and the most important for the, for the population was that uh, they found an association with lung cancer, mortality, ischemic heart disease, and birth weight. So birth weight is an outcome that has been studied more, more recently, about 10 years ago it has been started. And birth weight is very important because birth weight is a marker of health for all life. So uh, when the mother are exposed to higher air pollution during pregnancy, uh, there is a higher risk of prematurity 
of low birth weight uh, for, the, for the children. And also that is another example from another study, but I think it's quite representative also of the effects we can have regarding air pollution. So this is a study that was done in schools in Barcelona, where they classified school in low concentration school and high concentration school, and they performed a cognitive test in the children. They were between seven and nine four times during one year. And here we have the performance of the working memory, that is one of the cognitive tests that's, that was done, in uh, children from low air pollution school and here from high air pollution school. So at the beginning of the year, we already see a difference between children going to high and to low air pollution school. But at the end of the year, this difference is very big, and this difference is equivalent of one year of life. So at the end of the year, an, a kid from a, two, uh, from a high air pollution school had a working memory one year younger than a kid from a low air pollution uh, air concentration school. So just uh, that was a couple of examples, but in general, the long-term exposure to air pollution is associated with all-cause mortality, asthma incidence, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, perinatal outcome, fertility, and cognitive impairment in, in adults as well. So I, will sh I wanted to show you a recent study we have published that is the closest thing I find in ecology that we have done. So it's a, it's a study where we used mosses to assess air pollution exposure to in our population. So first of all, a, a PM is a mixture of a lot of components, including metals, and we know that metals are associated to oxidative stress and inflammation. And there are known toxic metals, usually uh, through oral ingestion, so, so just cadmium and lead, for example. And there is also others that are think to be potential toxic metals and even some metals that are classified cancerogenic. But uh, there is very little information about the health effects of long-term exposure atmospheric metals. So metals are measured in the fixed stations, but it's uh, in very few fixed stations. So in France, here are the few fixed stations where they are measuring, so, uh, not continuously, but in campaigns, uh, metals. They are very expensive, and they are not enough metals to have, to ga to have a map uh, across the country. So we need an alternative, and the one alternative was biomonitoring of air quality. So there is um, biomonitoring going on in several campaigns since the 60s using mosses. Why uh, using mosses? Uh, because mosses absorb rainwater and they trap particles. So they don't have roots. As they don't have roots, all we find in the, party, in the mosses came from the air. And they have a, a very high toleration of large concentration of metals, and they live several years. Also, they are easily collected, and the price of measuring is, cannot, is not very high. And so we can map uh, metal distribution. In France, the, there is a campaign that is called BRAM, where they have done now its five surveys of, her, of Moses collection all around France uh, between 96 and 2016 now, and they can link this map to cohorts. So in France, uh, they collect mosses in around 500 places all around the country, and then using the metals concentration measured in each one of these locations, we can statistically develop maps, and here is an example of lead, where we can find also the highly polluted regions known in France. 
So we linked this map with a cohort. A cohort is a group of people we followed during many years in epidemiology. Uh, that here it's uh, to, uh, 20,000 participants that are followed up by questionnaire every year. Uh, that started in 1999 and were uh, 89, and they were between 35 and 50 years old as enclosure, uh, inclusion. And for all these participants, we have a lot of individual variables that we can adjust for so, so socioeconomic, lifestyle variables. And we also have the home address, at least since uh, the inclusion, but also. Uh, we apply the residential calendar, so we have addresses for all participants, sometimes even from uh, where they were born. And here is the distrib special distribution of all our subjects in the Gazelle cohorts at recruitment. And this is a description, so we have a very high proportion of males in most of, this, uh, of, of the regions. And here uh, we have also the, the, the darker the, the regions, the higher proportion of smokers. So in, it's more or less one third of the population was a smoker. But we don't see any special pattern that could explain the mortality pattern. So using uh, the MOS biomonitoring, so we measured metals in MOSs that came from the atmosphere. Then we developed maps of exposure, and then we linked that map with the address of all the participants. And then after linking that map, we do some statistical analysis, adjusting for all the individual variables. And so we can assess the risk here of all-cause mortality for metals. So the main result is we group the metals from anthropogenic source and the metal from natural sources. And uh, we see that when there is a NASA ratio above one, it means that there is a risk. So there is, uh, for, for subjects living in higher air pollution metal concentration from anthropogenic sources, 17% higher risk of mortality. And we don't find this excess of mortality in participants that were exposed to higher concentration of metals uh, from natural sources. So we did two different analyses because we classified the metals according to two methods with a priori knowledge and using PCA components. And with both, uh, we have more or less the same metals in the both anthropogenic uh, groups and we have very similar results, so here an increase of 16% of mortality for participants living in a higher concentration metal comparing to the ones in living in low air metal uh, concentration. What is important of this study also is as mosses were collected in forests, we thought, we think, we know that the maps are not very are not representative of what happens in cities where we have a high exposure variability of, as I showed you at the beginning. So these uh, analyses were done only with half of participants. We assume <coughs> the risk would be even higher because the concentration in metals would be even higher. Okay, so we have plans to do the same thing with cancer, with uh, cognitive decline in adults, and we have also a project where we <coughs> will collect mosses in four cities, in, in cemeteries in four cities in France, and we will use the data, well, that is another cohort with 200,000 participants all over France. So the summary of known health effects of air pollution so we have we, the, air, uh, la, the mortality related air pollution is only the tip of the iceberg. So the, f the four or eight million people dying because of air pollution are only of a small proportion of the people affected by air pollution because before mortality we have hospital admission and emergency room visits and physician office visit. 
reduce physical performance, medical use, symptoms, and even the subclinical effect. So it's a very higher proportion of people affected by air pollution than the one that are actually die for air pollution. So I come back to this. So air pollution has effects in almost every organ and system. It has effect in all the population, probably with a higher susceptibility in children and in elder. And that uh, was my message. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Thank you. That was a, an extremely illuminating talk covering very many areas. Can I ask you more of a very personal question? I am living now in a few days here in B Lisbon yes. and I have the choice of walking on the road when I come to this symposium or I walk in the green way just to the side. Do you know where I speak of? Yes. Is it really worth my effort to cross the street? Yes. Ah, thank you. <laughs> and also another point that is important that at least in healthy people and um, for the short term effects, uh, there is um, many studies that have proven that the benefits of exercise are greater than the negative health effects of air pollution exposure. So um, it's always better to walk and to cycle even if we are more exposed because all the positive effects of, of physical activity will tackle part of the negative air pollution effects and have much more benefit effects for a lot of other, uh, of other risk factors. So this kind of study need to be done on the long term to see if there is also a benefit on the long term, but we suppose so. And uh, while well, this was done mainly, these kind of studies were done mainly with people, healthy people, because we cannot do that with people already sick and, and compare. Also, what we tend to recommend is when you have the choice, when you walk and you cycle, try to uh, avoid the traffic as much as you can. So even 20 to 50 meters can make a difference regarding exposure. Um, I also have a, a question. Um, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the most part of the studies concerning uh, air pollution is always, uh, they are always related with the NO2 or uh, NO or ozone um, or PM. Yes. But there is none concerning the effect of ammonia. Uh, and uh, here in Europe, because uh, in the States, more and more uh, people are concerned about the role of ammonia, not by directly pollution, but by um, uh, uh, drivers of uh, PM uh, 2000. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it's important, uh, partic particularly I'm very much concerned because here uh, in the Mediterranean areas uh, where we have uh, a huge uh, time of uh, hot uh, time where there is uh, a, an enormous volatilization of uh, ammonia, um, it goes Yes, there are, there are some studies. Not, uh, most of the studies, as you said, are NO2, NOx, PM. And now ultra fine, we have to start mm -hmm. to have. And uh, ozone. And there are, there are starting to be more studies regarding uh, other components or the gases or other precursors of PM as well. And um, I, I just participated in a report done by the French government about what about the co different component, or component of PM? And we find ammonia in a few studies, not enough to draw a conclusion, but enough to say that we need to um, assess and do more research uh, regarding specific components 
including metals and some others like ammonia uh, regarding health. The problem we have here also is it's more difficult also to measure and we have less, yes. less ways to assess uh, individual exposure than we, we have for, for this one. Yeah, mm. okay. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering about, um, in terms of the effects of acute bouts of um, air pollution exposure, would it be um, possible for it to be reversible? So for example, if you're living in a very good quality air pollution um, country, for example, and visiting other countries that may have poorer air pollution, if you are only exposed for a short amount of time and go back to your home country, for example, um, is it like shown that it is reversible or is it still kind of like in the graph it seems that it just goes down a little bit but kind of can continue to go up? No, uh, it's, it's reversible on the, on the short term. Uh, mainly for, for, for young and healthy people it's reversible. And actually there are also studies uh, that have shown the benefit effect of measures that have decreased air pollution in some countries. So, for example, in Ireland, when they um, banish coal, uh, they, they show the few months after the, the stopping using coal a uh, decrease in, in respiratory disease, in, uh, uh, very impressive. Uh, in China, for the Olympic Games, also, uh, in Beijing, they had to shut down many factories and decrease traffic because of the Olympics or thanks to Olympics, and the, he the acute health of the population was improved. It was shown much less emergency visit due to asthma and COPD exacerbation, for example. Yeah. Hello, and uh, thank you for your talk. The first, of, first of all, I realized realize that uh, living outside the Barcelona, I took the decision to live <laughs> outside the Barcelona was great for me. Yes. So thank you for, for that. Um, it's known from decades, but uh, uh, related with the, with the health, you work with economists about the cost of health. The problem, uh, it, it has not said yet, but uh, one of the problems that we have is who pays for everything mm -hmm. and the cost of externalities and who is distributing the shares of the cost of all these things. I was talking with, on Friday with the uh, director of environment of the port of Barcelona, the harbor of Barcelona, and he was worried about the fine that we got from the commission from uh, the yeah. pollution. But I don't think that they, they are going to, to be charged a, anyway for the pollution they, they provoke. My, my question is, uh, in your studies, uh, there are economies that uh, I think that we, we should pass the message that the externality should be on the table these days and uh, we, we should still to work. So personally, I don't. Uh, work with the economists, but there is some ec health economists, and uh, um, they ha the problem. I think that is a personal opinion. Uh, the problem of this thing is that um, politicians only think of a few years ahead for the election, and the measures that could have a health benefit, and so the real health benefit and a real decrease in health consumption uh, costs uh, would be too long for them to be good to apply. But uh, yes, there is, a, th there is a old field uh, about that, but I, I, I don't, it's, it's not my main expertise. Four-year cycles are known forever. Yeah. So we are in the, the uh, I, I cannot translate, the Dia of la Marmota, the, the movie. So we know that. Yeah. So in a way, for the guys that wants to do communication, and I think that will be a talk of communication, we need to escape from these Dias de la Marmota. Huh? Yeah. And we need to try to solve these problems. Well, I think that goes in the same way what we were talking yesterday also in the debate and things like that. Uh, most, a lot of people ask me, so how should I do, uh, should I wear masks? No. 
what you should, the first advice is to vote for people who will do something. That is my first advice at personal level because at personal level what we can do and it will be helpful for you and for the population is leave the car at home. That is the first. So the main problem now in Europe is traffic and the solution is to close the to close the street for traffic and to improve a very good health, uh, trans uh, public transport system and promote cycling and walking and have nice cycling ways and etc. That is the main solution. But at the end, it's the politicians and it's above that take the decisions that will have a real impact. Last. Thank you, Bennett. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Benedict, for your lovely talk. Uh, my question is a little bit follows on from the last comment. The health-related costs that you've shown, are they being used now to sort of quantify and justify um, new urban design? And has it been shown how the proportion of green space or the distribution of urban trees can affect health through its mediation on um, air pollution or other, other factors that are the, the bigger drivers? Yes, so there is a big, uh, so now air pollution is getting in a bigger field including the benefic uh, aspects of more green space and more blue space and more cycling lanes and less cars and urban distribution. So it's a, it's a mix of everything. And yes, there are people studying that. So now, f until now, most of the research is done risk factor by risk factor, but now we try to integrate different risk factors together, or different urban risk factors together that, I don't know if you have heard of the exposome. So the exposome is, uh, is all the exposures from outside. So we have the genetics on one side, and we have the exposome on the other side that is all the exposures that could be good or bad from the outside. And in the exposome, there is all the urban factors that probably interact together. And so one of the first interaction we started to do in, in this kind of field is noise and traffic, because they are very much related. And uh, we have, well, the, the research community have shown that noise have health effects independent of traffic and traffic has health effects independent of noise. But now the, the idea is to integrate a lot of more uh, urban uh, risk or benefit factors that we are exposed in our daily, in our daily lives. I don't know if I answered your question. That's okay, it's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think that I think that we have to to, to stop uh, here because uh, we are going to coffee break. Uh, but before we go uh, and we leave this space because we are coming only to this uh, to this uh, place uh, this afternoon because uh, tomorrow uh, at the end no. No, at uh, 12 uh, we are coming here, but uh, meanwhile between uh, 11 to 12 uh, we are dispersing between parallel sections and symposia, which means that uh, you will have an important role, and the important role is to um, select the best uh, oral communication in your section. Uh, we have um, awards of, for oral, two oral communications, and that depends on the vote of the public, which means that you need to be very uh, attent. You need to go to your section. Don't bother uh, about that. You only have to choose or select the one that you think it will be better. And we have everything uh, in, uh, in the web page because everything, as I said, since the beginning, uh, we are not using paper. Sorry about that, but you have all the digital facilities.
because we are in a digital area. So get used to. <laughs> okay? Thank you. And Thank you. go and enjoy coffee. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. I hope it was what you expected. I didn't know also yeah. okay. so how to... Thank you.